Okay, we're going to get started. So uh, we're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance, if everybody could rise. I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So welcome to tonight's uh, Chelmsford School Committee Public Forum. Uh, this is the third and final public forum we'll be holding for this year. Uh, previous forums, uh, we've discussed school safety and scheduling options, while tonight's forum will focus on social emotional, social emotional programming in the schools. If you've been watching the school committee meetings this year, you probably noticed that social emotional programming has been a central theme of the different schools and departments that are presented at the meetings. The purpose of tonight's forum is to dive a little bit deeper into what social emotional learning is and look at the many ways that it's being addressed in the district. We have a number of different presenters with us here tonight, along with my fellow school committee members, Donna Newcomb, Al Thomas, and our newest member, Maria Santos, who are seated in the front. Uh, to get things started, I would like to invite uh, Assistant Superintendent Linda Hirsch to say a few words and to in introduce our panel. Just a few words. I'm a, I'm a woman of few words. So thank you for coming. Just what we said, we're going to talk a little bit about social emotional learning, but then what does that academic piece look like? And with us today, we have uh, most of our team here today for our department coordinators as well as our consultants. So we're just going to kind of go right down the line, if you don't mind. This is Lorraine Wilson. She's our department coordinator of social emotional learning and school counseling. Eric Mann, he is our, he is our uh, consultant to help us with this process. This is his third year with us or second year? The, yeah, it feels like a long time. I'm in the second year with us. Um, Katie Sims, she's our department coordinator for PE, Health, and Family Consumer Sciences. We have Kelly Rogers. She's our literacy, Title I director, and L coordinator. She wraps it all up into everything. We have John Morris. He is our science coordinator. We have Stephanie Quinn. She's the department coordinator for history and um, social sciences, as well as Abby Dick at the end. She's our department coordinator for ELA uh, for grades 5 through 12. So we're going to start off with a little presentation just to kind of go over the key tenets of social emotional learning, and then we're just going to turn it into what does that look like in the academic standing and what do department coordinators do and what that looks like, and then we'll open it up for questions. We have a, a question and answer after the first part and then after the second part, so feel free to chime in. So at this time, I'm just going to ask for uh, Katie and Lorraine. They're going to start off this presentation. You're more than welcome to do it from where you are. And I can be your human clicker, or one of you can come up here, whatever you feel comfortable with. We can stay here. We'll okay. Want to click? Yeah, I love it. All right. Well, thank you for having us tonight. We're excited to be here. Um, just to go over what we're going to discuss with you tonight, we have that up here on our overview. Uh, so we're going to start with a six-minute video. It goes over the five SEL competencies and what each one of those would look like in the academic classroom. And it's a good mix of different ages. So you'll see some elementary school classrooms, you'll see some middle school classrooms, and you'll see some high school classrooms. So kind of what does SEL look like in the moment? Uh, after that, We'll talk a little bit about the connection between our um, pride core values and SEL competencies and how those overlap in a variety of different ways uh, at, for the whole district at all of our schools. Then we'll talk a little bit about um, each department and how social emotional learning looks, what social emotional learning looks like in a science classroom, what it looks like in a math classroom, et cetera. And then um, we'll have some questions at the end. So you can play the video. that we get much more out of them when we first address social emotional needs. So for us it's actually an academic intervention and not just an emotional one. If we expect students to be college and career ready, 
It's important for us to focus on these skills and competencies. Self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. Self-awareness is the ability to identify your emotions, to be able to tie thoughts and feelings to behaviors. We find that self-awareness is one of the hardest things for young people. Being aware of their own body space and the impact of their words and emotions on other people. So a lot of the work we do is reflective through conflict mediation, through circles, through journaling. Having them see their own impact on the world and then how to shift that or make a different choice next time. Self-management is the ability to self-motivate, to have self-control, to regulate one's emotions. In the classroom, that may be a breathing exercise, or that might be counting five, or taking a break. So with students who don't really know how to deal with their anger, or don't really know how to resolve conflict, we're giving them a tool that helps them deal with it in a less stressful way. Social awareness is about embracing diversity, showing empathy for others. Activities might include service learning projects, addressing social justice issues. Role playing is a great opportunity for students to address how a person might have felt in a conflict on the, on the playground. We're gonna see if other people have had some of the very same experiences around bullying that we've had. You're in my boat if you have a bully now. Wow, I see a lot of people. Relationship skills are important in project-based learning. It's the ability to work cooperatively with someone to resolve conflict. It's the one skill you need your whole life. You may not need calculus tomorrow, but you have to know how to work in relationship, whether it's for a coworker or a life partner. You have to know how to handle conflict and how to handle challenges. Sometimes at recess, Miney would come over and like just start talking about us and saying mean things. Is it your job to make Danae's job at school hard? No. I know it's a form of bullying and sometimes I'll say sorry to her. So you choose to be someone's ally and make a better choice. Responsible decision making is considering the well-being for self and others. It's evaluating the consequences for various behaviors or actions. We do this through shared agreements, one-to-one -one problem solving, or having students debate an issue. If you were like, hey, Kushida, what can I, uh, how much does an A cost in this class? And you like took out your wallet and, you know, and I was like, uh, I think 50 bucks would work. Which one of us would be corrupt in that case? You're the one that's asking for the money. We're truly teaching these students to be productive citizens. We're teaching them life skills. We're teaching them how to problem solve effectively. We're teaching them how to be resilient. I think of all the billions of dollars we've spent on Title I and all these intervention programs, and, and when all is said and done, what do we have to show for it? I think we're, you know, we're trying to teach technical things instead of devoting some of the resources to teach who you are as a person. Once you know who you are, then learning becomes exciting because you've already established a discipline.
I think that is important for us to understand um, as a district, as, as parents, as educators, is that social emotional learning and academics are not sort of separate and apart for e from each other, and that when students are um, have a good basis um, in their social emotional skills, that they are ready to learn academically. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the core competencies for SEL and um, a little bit about our pride core values and sort of how those things are connected. Um, so when we think about students um, and their SEL competencies, we think about their self-awareness, whether or not they're able to identify their emotions, do they have uh, a good perception of themselves, um, can they recognize their strengths? Are they self-confident? Um, and then thinking about their self-management when they're, when they're emotionally regulated, they're more ready to learn. And so are they able to handle stress that comes their way? Um, and we look at what that looks like at you know the elementary level, the middle school level, the high school level. Um, and then thinking about um, social awareness, um, and this is where Katie and I were talking a lot about sort of what are the overlaps um, in our pride values, which have been established by the district as, as its set of core values for a long time, and where social emotional learning um, comes into play. Um, and really thinking about can students take um, the perspective of another person, um, whether that's in literature or whether that's one of their peers. Um, are they learning to be empathetic? Um, are they appreciating diversity and respecting others um, that may be different from themselves in, in some way? Um, are our students able to build relationship skills um, with their peers, with their, um, your, their families, with their communities, with their teachers? Um, Really working on teamwork, which is one of the one of the um, essential aspects of, of pride, um, and then responsible decision making. Can they identify a problem? Can they break it down into its parts? Can they work with um, another uh, a peer or or a teacher in um, problem solving? Um, can they reflect on the decisions that they're making? What the pros and cons of any given situation are, um, and are they able to? sort of participate in society as a responsible citizen. So we looked at um, a few different examples of sort of how um, the, um, the SEL and academics sort of you know, are overlapped or intertwined and the different um, skills that we want students to have um, in the academic curriculum that are also reflected in what we're teaching them in, in social emotional learning. Um, and we have an example from each of the, the core components of self-awareness, self-management, um, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. So Katie and I were just going to point out a couple of examples where you could see like in a math setting what that might look like or what it might look like in speaking and listening. Um, so in thinking about, if you think about um, when students are looking at literature and texts, can they um, take a character um, and look at that character from multiple perspectives? Can they um, express what a character might character might be thinking or feeling? Um, can they take that character's point of view? Um, can they describe um, the different experiences that character has had? Um, and that might be an example of, uh, of an EL, that might be an ELA example, you know, for, for a student um, understanding the concept of social awareness. Uh, another, another example to look at is under the relationship skills. Um, so justify their conclusions, communicate them to others, and respond to arguments of others. So if you take that, you might not think of math when you first read that, but um, this the, that's why we wanted to share this example. So the student might be doing a math problem on their own, but then they're taking that and then they're showing the class or the students how in the teacher how they got to that answer they're justifying their answer they're making an argument for that their answer um, and they're using their communication skills in order to do that so they have to compile all the information kind of sort it out present it to everybody and make a case and an argument maybe for their side if they're trying to um, demonstrate something specific uh, another thing to note, we're going to talk a lot tonight about 
how social emotional learning is integrated into all different areas of curriculum. Um, but I think it's important to also mention that especially at the younger grade levels, it is important to take these skills of self-awareness, self-management, and the, the rest of the five competencies and thoughtfully teach students about them. So we might not use terminology like this in a K-1-2 classroom, but it might look like um, exploring emotions, how to recognize other students' emotions, um, putting students in groups, how do, in kind of talking them through, doing, making a decision. How do you think, now how do you feel? How do you think you made the other person feel? Um, so there is integration across the board, but I think before you get to that integration too, it's important that we thoughtfully teach these specific skills to students before they're put in a math class and trying to make an argument for their case. Um, so I just wanted to mention that before we um, move forward. Right. And I think, too, um, if we're thinking about having our students be college and career ready, these are really the skills that, you know, we're looking for in students who are ready to go to college or maybe join the workforce. Um, and they're teamwork and um, being involved and in, in, in taking an active role in a team are really 21st century skills that we want to be teaching. Do you want to stop and take some questions now or would you like to continue on? And, or if people have questions at this point before we get into the academic piece. I'm pausing. Okay, let's, let's move on to the next piece. And the, oh, we have one question. Ooh. <laughs> Mic. Yeah, it's, it's a big microphone. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm probably new to the, all the uh, teaching methods that happen in the school systems here. Um, but um, can you highlight uh, maybe at different grade levels, sort of statistically sampling them as to how you, um, how the curriculum encourages team-based learning uh, as a actual structure? You know, the Montessori school systems have a team-based learning. There are other schools that are in the neighboring towns have adopted some things, and have, there is chatter around the pa in the parent community. Mm -hmm. But could you highlight maybe how Chemsford schools are either planning to adopt or are currently uh, engaging that in certain levels of the school uh, grades? Sure, and uh, in, the, in the PowerPoint that I'm going to put up next, we have some examples of what that would look like in different classrooms. I know it, it, it's fine. You can ask those questions ahead of time, um, what that would look like, because there is that collaborative piece, and without that collaborative piece, you know, we don't want students just learning in a silo by themselves and then not being able to explain that and communicate that information. So I'll be able to give you some specific examples as we go through the presentation. Would that be okay to wait to that point? Great. Any additional questions about SEL in general? All right, this is where I switch off to the next next piece that we have here. So um, we're just going to talk a little bit about that academic uh, connection. What um, Lorraine was saying is it's true. If a student is not socially, emotionally ready to learn, they're not going to learn. That is a block. They are intertwined. They're together. So without that piece, they're not going to be able to move forward because they're going to be you know, more concerned about what's happening with them, how they're feeling, how they're regulated, how they're being perceived by their peers. So it's very important that we take that into consideration. And it's not just time to do so social emotional learning at this time during the day, it's in all the curriculum. We have to ha make sure it's embedded and it has to be daily, weekly, yearly. So it's this constant flow and fluidity to it where teachers are constantly bringing in that same academic language that they're learning in their programming for maybe second step. And then what is that going to be happening when they're working with their students who may or may not be struggling? They'll help them through that process. So you had a chance already to um, meet the team and we're missing a couple of team components, but if you can see, we have a department coordinator for every single department to make sure that there's a content area specialist for our teachers to be able to integrate some of these things. So many people have multiple departments. Um, you have some that have singular departments. It all depends on you know what, what that actual subject area is. So this is our team. They're here. Most of them are here today, so they'll be able to answer any specific questions you might have about that. So I thought it was important to understand what is a department coordinator. Every school district has their own name for something. You might hear department head, you might hear administrative person, anything out there. So a department coordinator is a full-time administrator 
for their content area. And what it is, is they're, they're basically the primary resources for the teachers when it comes to any type of content questions and the pedagogy that goes along, the teaching that goes along with that specific subject area. Everybody has their own language within their, no pun intended, it's not the language department, but they have their own language that goes along um, with how they're teaching. So for example, when we're speaking about reading in say music, they're talking about how to read sheet music. What does that look like for a student compared to text? They also are the primary evaluation evaluator for the department. They work in conjunction with the principals and the assistant principals to make sure that the teachers have supervision, support, professional development. They, are, are, they help teachers with their instructional practices, any new things that are coming down the pike for that. Professional development is a very key role in this. This is where they provide everything for those teachers and what they need. And then um, there's also a time where they're evaluating their own program, all right? What is happening in this program? Do we need new programming? Do we need to make some changes. So they're doing all that research and evaluating of their own program. I was a little hesitant to put up these slides because I was afraid that when the department coordinators saw their slides, they might, you know, say, oh, wow, that's a lot for this job and maybe walk out the door. But if they all stay, this is a good thing. And um, again, they're working with those principals directly. It continues. They have more work to do. But what's important is that they have to work as a team. So it's not just one department gets this, the other department has to wait. Those departments have to work to, together and make the best best decisions for children and make sure the programming is robust enough that students have access to everything that's going on. So that is a, a key piece there is working as a team. And then if there's any specialized programs, so for example, even not even necessarily programs, but even uh, professional development. So Stephanie works with John and they're working on inquiry-based learning. So that's very important. So you have social studies and science and they're linking that curriculum together working with the, right now, currently, the elementary school teachers where that's new to them with their new science standards. So that's how they're integrating those pieces. So you have to have departments that overlap each other and link it together to order, in order to provide what we do for our students. Um, they're also responsible for any assessments and data analysis. How are students learning? What do we do when they're learning? What do we do when they're not learning? So they take, they're kind of the keepers of that data system and helping teachers to go back and look and see what's the data telling them in order to make those changes. And obviously they have their department meetings, they participate in nightly public forums like tonight. And um, they're obviously responsible for their budget. So that's how they make those decisions on what teachers will be receiving and what's needed. They give recommendations to the superintendent as to next steps, things that the department may need specifically in order to keep the program going. So they have to have certain qualifications. So you know you have very highly educated people here. So at least a master's degree, if not beyond. Many people have beyond at this point. And then they have to have an administrator's license. It has to be as a supervisor for their content area and or principalship. And five years of teaching experience. They have to have experience with leadership, supervisor, uh, supervising people. They have to know their laws and regulations. And then most importantly, interpersonal skills. You're working with a lot of different people, a lot of different schools. Everybody has their way of seeing things, so it's that finesse that you might need in order to make some of those changes or movements based on either a team, a school, perhaps different administrators. So those interpersonal skills is key because you're not going to be able to get things together for students. People would be not communicating at that point. And they have to have that team environment and they have to have excellent communication skills, which they all do. And then one of the biggest things is, is managing your time and projects. This is, we're not on a bell system. It's one of the, the most interesting things when you go into the administrative world. There's no bell system telling you you're gonna start here and this is gonna start at this point, it's gonna end, this is when you eat. Sometimes we grab M&Ms and that's lunch and it's a good day. Um, we're just excited somebody had them. So it's managing those projects. So how how long is this going to take? When does it need to be implemented? So it's almost like that backward design of this is what I want to achieve. How am I going to get to achieve that part? So now we're talking about those key components, those competencies for social teaching practices, but then what does that look like for an instructional practice? So I have a you know, small little chart here. I, I will not read my um, screens to you, but it is trying to take those six self-awareness pieces, I mean self, um, competencies, and then putting into what does that look like in the classroom? So you asked about cooperative learning and teamwork. Te students need to know their roles. They need to know their expectations. How is that going to work when 
moments when things are going well and when things are not going so well. So how is that team going to get back together? It's not just, oh, well, you two, this group didn't work, so let's move on to something else. They have to go back to those interpersonal skills of what does that look like? So for cooperative learning, so who's taking care of the, the task itself? Who's like the timekeeper? Who's doing the communication? Who's doing the writing? So at the lower grades, you see a lot of that. And it is a little, when you start these processes, especially at the younger kids, it, it is a little robotic at first, but they need that practice over and over so that it becomes internalized and it does become fluid for the students. So it does take some time. And then what is that instruction going to look like? And more, most importantly, how are we going to build the competency? So they've learned something, but then how do you keep it going and sustaining it so that when they go into the next classroom, how are they going to remember what they've learned and then link it to their current learning in that classroom? So a lot of the departments um, lend themselves to that, where other departments have to work pretty hard to make sure that their, their, you know, their goals and their curriculum and their standards are aligning with what's happening in the other classrooms. Um, the other piece we did, we were talking about a couple of examples. So um, you brought up the example of characterization. So you either have direct or indirect characterization. Direct characterization is very clear, mostly for students, right? They can tell you what the stresses are because it, it describes the, the actual character. You know, they're sitting, waiting for it in a blue shirt with um, 15 pieces of paper in front of them, so it's very clear. Indirect is where you would see a little bit more of the social-emotional pieces. They have to infer what that character is like, so what is the stressors for that character, how they feel, what they, what they look like when they're having that stressor. But then the conversation can switch, and you can talk about, well, what was it like for that character? What's, um, when they're not in the zone, what would they do? So they can bring in those SEL words, and then they could talk about, well, what could they do, what could they have done if the character didn't do it? Because sometimes the characters don't do it. You know, they're, they're a tragic hero and, you know, happens. So they just move on. So that's an example in literature on how you can integrate that. When it comes to um, health education, Katie, I don't know if you wanted to speak to it, or you wanted me to just kind of go through it with you. Up to you. Okay, no, it's fine. I was just going to go on. We're just giving some examples here. So in health, what does it look like for them? So how are they analyzing what's happening? How do they have conflict resolution? What are they going to do to determine their decision making? And then most importantly, like how do they advocate for themselves? So instead of just... Um, you know, moving along because the class is moving on, how do you say this is what I need? Or what does a group need? Or what does a group of students need or an individual need? So those advocacy skills, when it's integrated into health, is, is key, and they use those same type of words. They also do it when it comes to their um, physical education, right? So they're linking it to their standards. What does it look like in grade four? What are the outcomes related to social emotional learning when you're looking at your individual standards? cute pictures of the kids, that's always nice. In um, our art classroom, what is that going to look like for self-awareness? This was an example that was given at the um, presentation for Fine and Performing Arts. So a student that's playing their instrument, where, where are they with that instrument? Are they not playing? If they're not playing so well, what is it? Do they need to read the music differently? How do they express their emotions when they are frustrated and it's not working together with the other group, if they're in a, and especially if they're in an ensemble and, and people are counting on them? So this would be an example of what it would look like in an art classroom. And then in mathematics, um, one of the biggest things is trying that perseverance and possessing what you need to be a math student. There is that big piece, and I highlighted it as math phobia. So how do you get that mindset that it's you? Uh, people, I've said it before. People have said, "Oh, I can't do math. Right? Oh, math's too hard for me." How do we get people to get past that math phobia? break down the components of it, stick with it, manage it, get help when you need help, and then kind of display, we talk about the grit, that perseverance piece, which aligns directly with perseverance and our PRIDE acronym. So it's important that we get that piece together and that mindset that, you know, anybody can do things. You have to, that, if you start with the right mindset, you're walking into it, that's half the battle. And then when it comes to biology, they're learning the biology standards, but then what does that look like in real world problems, right? What does that social emotional learning work for students that might be working on something for poverty? We had one student, um, I think she graduated a couple of years ago, she had a passion for um, 
people that didn't have access to water and what that meant for them. They, you know, what uh, food, cleaning themselves, being able to, you know, sustain their, their health. She had a passion for it, so she took that advocacy skill, let's say, in health with the, what she's learned when it came to biology and then applied it to that. So it's trying to find those standards that actually apply to what's going on and then having students show that competency with it, with, a, with something that's tangible, not just we learned it, we're moving on. So that's very important when it comes to the sciences. And another example, so here it is for social studies, there's a crosswalk. So we use what's called second step, and that's our social emotional curriculum. If you'd like to do that, what does that look like in, in the classroom? And then what is that gonna look like if you're in social studies class? So you wanna talk about civics, working together, being collaborative, working as teams. So these are very key things, and this is just an example of the crosswalk for our pre-K and K grade one, two students, it goes on past that. So there's a lot of resources out there, but what we try to do, so the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has a whole page on this, and there's lots of things that you can go and do, but in Chelmsford, we made it a, a, an effort to make sure that we had everything we needed for our district to implement something thoroughly, right? Instead of, well, I was doing this, and she's over there trying that, and he's over there. We all got together, put our heads together, and said, okay, let's do this strategically. Let's put this in a plan. Let's look at the different programming out there. Let's pick that programming, and then let's link it back to the academics so that everybody's talking about the same thing, same language, so when students come home, they know what they should be doing. And that was kind of my end piece, and I was going to open it up to questions. I didn't know if anybody wanted to add anything from here. <coughs> See how inclusive I am? My self-awareness. <laughs> yeah. So questions. We have a question all the way down in the front. No? You had your hand up first. <laughs> I, I run a classroom. I know whose hand was up first. <laughs> here comes the mic. Here we are. Uh, thank you. Um, so we talked about how um, social-emotional learning is necessary for kids to access the uh, curriculum and to maintain engagement in uh, the curriculum as well. Can you talk about um, how um, some of the stressors for kids today have impacted their ability or kind of the trends that I guess that we're seeing uh, for kids? Because I think if you look in the newspapers and the magazines or, you know, um, in the Internet, you see that uh, social-emotional problems um, among kids are, are escalating. And um, what are the, some of the things that we're doing to be able to remediate that? I think um, a couple of things that come to mind. Um, we have been um, piloting, I think we've gotten a lot of good data from our um, YRBS um, Can you explain what that is? the Youth Risk Behavior, behavior Survey. survey. And um, I think that for us, that's led us to make some certain decisions um, because we do see definitely rising rates of anxiety, um, depression, um, thoughts of maybe suicide, um, things of that nature, and certainly substance use and or abuse. Um, and looking at that data from, from the YRBS, um, we sort of looked at where... Do we what you know? We're building certain skills in, el in elementary school with, um, with with second step, and then sort of when students get to that middle school age, they're starting to figure out who they are, experience a lot more sort of peer pressure, um, and we have been we piloted a screening um, this year specifically on anxiety and depression because those were two of the things that we saw come up the most on on the youth risk behavior survey. Um, and then thinking about sort of how we're going to respond um, in students who are found to be at risk for um, certain behaviors, certain choices, certain mental health issues. Um, and the, I think the great thing, um, you know, I started in December, and I think the great thing about the Challenge for Public Schools is there's so much support in terms of personnel, um, and especially in the mental health area. You know, I think that we're in a really unique position of having, um, you know, a, a psychologist and a counselor um, at each elementary school. At the middle school, we have multiple 
multiple counselors and a psychologist at each school. Um, at the high school level, um, we have six counselors and three psychologists. Um, we have great support from um, from Eric and Katie, who are, are um, helping us to implement um the PBIS and MTSS teams at each school. Um, so I really feel like what, what we, one of the advantages of, of being in Chelmsford is that we have the personnel to be able to roll out the initiative that, that we want and also to be able to follow up with students when these concerns are coming up, whether it's in a peer-to-peer -peer interaction or whether it's on a, um, a survey or a screening that we're doing. And I think that Katie and I are really working a lot together um, around looking at the, the data that um, comes out from from the different screening tools that we're using um, and also sort of narrative experiences of of. The, the counseling staff, the teaching staff, um, things that they might be seeing students deal with, like all kinds of different stressors, academic and social. Yeah, and just, just to add on to that, to bring the academic piece in here, we do find that especially when students get to high school, there's a lot of programming, there's a lot of options for them. That causes a lot of stress. They want every honors or AP class, and at some point what we'll do as coordinators, we sit with the students and say, what, what is it that you really want to study here? Because, I mean, at some point, scheduling is scheduling. There's only so many hours in the day, and you can only fit so many classes in. So if you're in this grade level, what is it that you think you really want to look at? Like, what's your passion? So maybe those would be the classes you might want to take at a higher level and then see how it goes with the other ones. Because we, what we don't want is students staying up till 2, 3 in the morning just to get everything done because they have this, because they think they have to do it. You know, I don't know if they, I don't know what they're thinking, why they have to have all that done because we don't put that pressure on there as long as they're taking their core academic in their programming, they, they're going to be fine. So we sit and do a lot of that counseling with them of like, what do you actually want to take? Because that's the course that I would put in for a higher level and then perhaps, you know, give yourself a break with something that's not necessarily your passion. Doesn't mean you don't like the course, but it's not your passion because they have to have fun. One of the biggest pieces of that is like, as a high, the high school looked at this, there was some, and it still resonates with me, there was a video that they put together and they were asking the students questions. You know, how, what do you feel like when the bell rings? It, your alarm goes off in the morning. Boom, they could answer that, tired. Don't want to get up, you know, all of that. What does it feel like when you're stressed? Oh, ba 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 ba. Then they ask them, what gives you joy? Pause. Kids looking up, looking down. I'm like, oh, they can't answer that question. Like, it didn't roll off their tongue. They can tell you what stresses them out, how they feel in the morning, what they do. And then finally, it was kind of even like, my friends, like with a question mark at the end, uh, sports, it's almost like they didn't know how to answer that question. So as adults, we have to take that step back of what are they actually doing because we can, they can tell you everything that stresses them out, but they can't tell you something that gives them joy. That's, that's kind of terrifying. So that was one of the biggest pushes at the high school level to just really work with students, find out what they need, and let them know you're going to be okay. We will help you get through this just depending on what you want to study, and there's lots of different programming. And they have things pulling at them, jobs, sports, uh, maybe activities. Activities. Maybe they have to babysit. I don't know. They have a lot going on in their lives, and we just want to make sure that they're doing things thoroughly. Can I say a couple of things. Uh, hi. Um, the uh, so stress obviously is is uh, is part of the equation, and and it's there's no question that kids are dealing with sort of unique stressors and. Uh, actually, uh, to some extent, not so unique stressors. I mean, we all deal with stress. Kids, um, uh, kids who are the most uh, sort of competent and successful uh, students are dealing with stress every day. Um, what we're seeing, um, not just in Chelmsford, but, but in my work sort of everywhere, is another set of uh, sort of in, uh, sort of interesting, an interesting piece that's connected to stress, and that's. Um, their their capacity to manage it, and not just the capacity to manage it, but the executive functioning that goes along with it. So their impulse control, their ability to regulate their emotions, to regulate their thinking, even to identify dysregulated thinking uh, that would, if they can notice a stressor, sort of what does it do to my thoughts? What do my thoughts do to my emotions? And then what happens in terms of my actions? And sometimes it's actually actions that uh, that get both adults and kids to notice, hey, um, I guess I was stressed. Um, but also um, their ability to, um, 
to shift their ability to uh, plan and organize and goal persist and time manage and all of those really, uh, those, those skills that take um, repetition and practice and daily work um, to get better. So not so much things that, that necessarily get taught in a lesson, but get taught in daily life. And that's the big challenge, I think, or one of the big challenges for the, uh, for the staff, uh, teachers, counselors, and administrators sort of integrating this work. Um, how do we help kids grow those ex executive skills so that not only they, they can know what stresses them, but they can know what it does to their thinking and to their feelings and helping them to sort of then be able to, to regulate and manage. Yep, you, you can keep asking questions. Come on, come on now. We have a question up back first. Put your hold. <laughs> um, I, this is more of an academic question, but, but the only example I've got is, is um, like in math. So I'm wondering if you encourage teaching practices which help the kids develop resiliency. So for example, when one of my kids was in middle school, one of their uh, math teachers had a policy that they could retake exams. Um, and, and it wasn't so much to improve the grade, although that's, you know, 99% of the time the direction it went, but it was to ensure that they really learned the material. So it's, it's that, you know, you need to take a test, you need to show progress, but even more importantly, the teacher said, I, I really want you to learn this. So they let them take it over and over again. So I don't know, um, it, it, are, are there teaching methods and other things you can extrapolate to, to all the rest of the subject matter to help kids learn to stick with it and, and be rewarded for that. Because some grading systems don't, you know, some classrooms don't do that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would say yes. I mean, you, you can take that same example and put it towards writing, right? You have X amount of exam, uh, uh, I'm sorry, X amount of um, essays. Once you go through those, if you are working on a specific skill, a student could go back in and redo that essay or a part of the essay. It doesn't have to be this um, laborious piece of writing over and over again. It's about getting that skill. So there's no policy per se, but many teachers do implement that because especially in something like mathematics, if you don't have the foundational skills, you're not going to continue on. You, you, there will be a gap at some um, point. But having that retest and then also not even just retesting, but then can they learn it a different way? So at the elementary level, what we try to do is have stations for mathematics. A lot of people hear about stations for reading, guided reading, balanced literacy. Well, what does that look like in a math class? So if we have this standard, you have a teacher that can get a group of kids, five of them, not the whole class, and then they can still be working on that standard in another station doing something different, but it's the same standard. Does that make sense? So it's trying to, it's, it's almost like you know, playing sports. How many times do you tap that ball? Practice, practice, practice. But it doesn't always have to be in a test form or in you know, paper pencil form. It can be other ways. So yes, that is something that we do promote, is to have students have the opportunity to go back, rework it, talk with a peer. Um, the high school actually even has um, one of their after school act clubs is like you can partner up with a peer. Like if you need help in a certain class, they'll put you together. It's almost like a TA when you went to college. So they have that process. But yes, that is something we promote. I don't know if anybody has specific examples. I do know with the math and the and the literature, we can talk about that. Make sure the, yeah, you have to have the mic near you. Just something I've seen effectively done in many classrooms at the different levels is that through class discussion, um, teachers are able to pause and provide good wait time, and I know that's not um, a very, you know, kind of out there example, but it's something small and subtle that they provide the wait time, they wait for more kids to put their hands up when, they answer, when they're ready to answer a question, and they, they call on a student or they might have a popsicle stick, however you're gonna call on your student. And if the student is unsure, they, they persuade them, they're giving them the encouragement, um, and they stick with the student and provide options for the student. So if the student really gets stuck, they can always say, you know, you can, do you want to phone a friend kind of thing, or, or give them other options. But by staying with that student for a comfortable amount of time, they're showing that student that they do believe in them, that they, they, they're going to wait for them, and that the student can persevere and their teacher believes in them. So I know it's really small and subtle practice, but it is happening in a lot of our classrooms, and they're doing it effectively. 
They can even use a clicker system too. Yeah. It doesn't even have to be, you know, calling yeah. yourself out. All kinds of ways. Even with our technology, there's a clicker system that alerts a teacher that I could use some more support in this without the whole world knowing. Because again, they don't want their peers to, you know, they want that perception out there with their peers. You know, teacher uh, encouragement and support is really important, but something else uh, matters, I think, here, and that is resiliency and perseverance are skills. Uh, and we have the ability, and with social emotional learning coming in and with all that the teachers and the coordinators and everybody's doing, have the ability to actually start to be more explicit about the skills of resiliency. And resiliency doesn't come from nothing. It doesn't actually come just from uh, a saying that says, try, try again. Uh, it, it comes from actually uh, being aware of what stresses you. It comes from actually um, being aware of the dysregulated thinking that comes when you're faced with a challenge. We we can all sort of relate to that, uh, and whether or not we have the ability to regulate that dysregulated thinking, uh, because that's really what resilience and perseverance are. That's our capacity to notice when things are sort of unraveling in our, our thought process to be able to help it get back sort of in order. Uh, and so we, um, all of the things that have been talking talked about in terms of supporting those students uh, are really important. What's equally important is being explicit about the skill and how important those skills are. Kids actually, if they understand that impulse control and emotional regulation and thought regulation and mental flexibility and the ability to shift those, uh, when they realize and have the insight that those things actually help their lives get better, uh, actually help them have more friends, actually be able to get along with their peers and be able to be able to persevere. Um, uh, they actually can align with the staff and say those are important skills for me to learn. Those are critical skills for, for everything, not just academics, but for later work. You think about kids who are struggling in college, it's not so much about usually about their reading and writing and math skills. It's usually about their executive functioning and their ability to be able to um, know their stressors and handle and manage those stressors. Abby. I was thinking ooh, about a couple <laughs> things. Whoa. Um, that I work with the teachers in middle and high school, and I think students at that age are really ripe to talk about self advocacy, like having the courage to say to an adult, I didn't do as well on that assignment as I wish I had. Can you give me some feedback and can I try again? Um, that's something that I think we're really trying to instill in them that maturity, that you're definitely not going to get great grades all the time and it might you might need to talk to an adult to work on that. Um, and to your point about stress, I think um, that educators are growing more sensitive to understanding when students are feeling overwhelmed and then coming up with academic solutions to help them overcome it. So for example, at the high school this year, the 10th graders are taking three M classes over the course of the school year. Um, they have to take the English first, and then the math, and then the science is right up at the same time as final exams. Um, and I was so excited to see the high school administrative staff say to the coordinators, is there something we can do about that? Like, can we do something with the final exams that are a little bit different so that students are not staying up all night worrying about final exams and MCAS at the same time? Um, and the teachers were really able to come together and collaborate and come up with something that was really outside the box for them. But I think it really sent the message that we are totally keeping in mind that this is going to be a stressful time for you. So that seemed really positive to me. You got another question, Donna? Or up front? She just likes being on TV. Um, so my question is, um, we're talking about the social emotional learning as it relates to um, academics. Um, I was kind of wondering how does this dovetail into uh, the disciplinary aspect of what it is that we have to do? Um, because I would imagine at this point, um, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, yet, it, uh, because we have such a focus on the social emotional learning, there must be some type of process that is involved now uh, when we have kids who are facing some type of disciplinary action because of the problems that they have around executive functioning and making the right choices. I mean, 
the rules still apply. I mean, it doesn't absolve you from Absolutely. the rules, but it's almost like that walk-through piece. And it, it, like anything else we do, I mean, I'll talk about the academic piece of it, and maybe so we can get some more insight on this point. But every student is different. You're a, a, addressing every discipline issue. You're addressing academic issues based on where that student currently is. So what might work for you may not work for me, right? I need somebody to say, Stop talking. Okay, got it. You, on the other hand, might need a different approach, right? Because that would that would make set you off, right? So it's the it doesn't mean that they don't have rules and they're not there's not going to be a consequence, right? So you have a behavior, you always have an antecedent and a consequence. One of those two things have to change in order to make sure that that behavior is changed, right? And I probably will kick it over here for the discipline piece too. Uh, uh, just a few thoughts on that. One is that I think that. We've sort of become much more proactive in terms of discipline versus reactive, and I think that that um, when you think about the multi-tiered systems of support and that common language and common practices that are built at that that first level, um, where um, the norms of the school environment are known, taught, modeled, you know, and practiced um, to mastery, and then the other thing is I think that. We see um, students at the center of their learning, I think, much more than maybe we had in the past. And I think that students are often involved in the norm settings for their groups if they're working in, t in teams or if they're in a classroom environment, the, the entire, you know, sort of the, the, their class as a group. And agreeing to those things as a group and being accountable to those things as a group and talking about, well, what, what do we do when um, someone operates outside of the, the norms that we have decided upon in our, in our classroom? Obviously, the um, as Linda was saying, the the rules still apply, and and students who um, are sort of operating outside of those rules, we um, you know we meet with them and talk with them, and I think. Um, you know, there certainly are still disciplinary actions that need to be taken based on um, a choice a student might make. But I think, um, you know, there, the school environment is, is positive and supportive um, and really guided by the expectations that have, have been set up and that students are being held accountable for versus a more sort of reactive or punitive approach. And so what an opportunity it is when um, you have a student who, uh, you know, has uh, has had behavior that sort of requires us to sort of take stock and, and take a look at, at what's happened. Uh, and while certainly we have to respond to, to uh, behavior that, that uh, operates outside of the rules, um, every one of those is an opportunity to help, uh, help students see sort of where it came from. And very rarely does it come right from the moment that it that it happened, but very often from what uh, what led to it, and making those connections. Um, and as I've seen so many times, by the way, in conversations or heard so many times, I should say, in conversations with administrators and uh, at Chelmsford schools, uh, they do an amazing uh, job of really wanting to know what's at the heart and what uh, what led to it, so so that they can actually uh, have a learning experience from the. Uh, uh, from the disciplinary action. Right, and I, th I think an, another piece of that is sort of asking what are the, the lagging skills or the unsolved problems sort of in the, in the vein of raw screen, right? Um, what is it that the student hasn't learned yet that they might need to learn, and what is the, the um, situation a student is facing where they can't, aren't able to, haven't been able to apply that skill? And I think we see now more than ever that those things can be, as Eric was saying, explicitly taught. Um, like other things. The um, classroom teacher, the advisors, the coaches are really in the trenches in terms of social emotional issues and deal with all kinds of things. But every once in a while, kids drop a bomb like, I don't think I'm safe, because they know the right things to say if you want to get you excited. I don't think I'm safe, or I think I might be pregnant. Now immediately, at least in my experience, that's beyond my level of discussing. <laughs> you know, we have social workers, psychologists, deans, guidance counselors. Where do they go first? Hmm. What, what's, you know, I'm a classroom teacher. I'm a social studies teacher. I guess maybe it's who's available, but we have, we were very fortunate to have all these resources. But I, I, would, I would guess that there's a hesitancy about 
where to go. I, mean, I think that would matter of you know what what the situation is, right? Um, kids typically go with someone that they feel comfortable with. Hopefully, the first line of defense is the classroom teacher. The person that sees them often. Did you want to say something? Oh, where does the classroom teacher go? They find they open the door and they talk to their neighbor next door and say, "Did what happened? <laughs> Can I talk to you?" Yeah, you know it's funny you brought that up because I was thinking about that. What's the social emotional health of our adults? And as we go through a lot of these programs, I feel like it's we're doing double duty. We're supporting the kids, but we're also supporting some of the adults and giving them language that they need. Um, like anything else, schools are a community, right? You you know who you, who you typically hang out with your team or maybe your department. You have your good friend. You can go to your dean. So it's a matter of who they've made that relationship with. Um, I'm not saying that they'd necessarily go and receive services, say from a school psychologist, but if that's someone that they're comfortable with, then that's what they should do. We, we call each other all the time, even this group that's here, we, we have a, an ongoing text strand uh, back and forth and it just keeps, you know, questions. And did, did anybody understand what I was saying? Am I saying the right thing? Did that make sense? Like all different things that you do, you have to find the people that you connect with to get that support. And everyone, hopefully the adults know that it's important that uh, you support each other. And it's that school community. Yep. Be loud. Oh, okay. I think the town has a program that's available to teachers and other town employees. I don't know anybody who use it, has ever used it. Does it get used enough? I, we wouldn't you know what I'm that. talking about? Yeah, yeah. Well, Dr. Lang's behind you. I think he'd like to answer that question. You can bring him the mic. Oh, we wouldn't have that information. Yeah. There is a, uh, there's a program called... Um, um, Inter interface? interface, yeah, interface, In interface. I believe um, that is. It's a, a service where you can call, and they have different counselors and whatnot. It's open not only to um, staff in the district, but uh, families uh, can use it as a counseling resource. Um, if you want, I'll actually uh, put some information together in the school committee packet for our next meeting, and we can talk about it at a, at a public meeting just so we actually have some of the referral information in front of us. But um, we receive a quarterly report from them that just talks about different uh, individuals within the community, obviously not by name, but just by numbers and kind of who has reached out, what kind of uh, services they have. Um, but there is that available for staff uh, or parents mm -hmm. within the community. I think we're becoming a more and more diverse group of students and our staff as well. Um, the people who actually are the role models and the, the folks that the students look up to. And so I'm wondering, how is it that we as a school community are helping each other to um, understand our diversity Mm -hmm. And in the process, teach our students about acceptance um, and maybe avoid that bullying stuff that we used to call bullying and now we call a, a bunch of other stuff, but it's still there. What, how do we deal with that? How do we help our teachers to help the students, all of the staff, and at the same time the students themselves to accept that everybody's mm -hmm. different and... Um, that although there are standards and norms that we all need to follow, that still there is a difference in how people react and how people are. And diversity comes in many forms. I'm not just talking about racial or any, that type of diversity, but every form of diversity. Thank you. I think the elementary level does a nice job. I don't know that I need that. I think the elementary level does a nice job um, through literature, to be honest. I know every school has um, different pieces, literature that uh, that is available to students um, around cultural diversity, about inclusion of students. And I think the conversations do happen along with, you know, they coincide with our civics, with our second step curriculum, and again, just what we've been talking about tonight, that they're, they're all integrated. Um, and just as an aside, um, as part of our teacher evaluation standard two is teaching all students. And teaching all students just means that. How are we um, reaching all students with that are different from us, right? Um, and so that's something that we have conversations about all the time with, with staff and with teachers to um, just become more aware and mindful of differences um, as a staff and also um, 
of our students. So very important. And I think that those conversations are, in my opinion, have, do take place. And like I said, at the elementary level, especially through literature that I've seen, um, and quite proud of that, because I think that it's a very strong um, piece that we have in place. And I, I, can I just to piggyback on that a little bit is even for the staff, how to work with students, that's reliant on professional development from us, right? Giving them the, the toolbox that they need in order to be able to support all students and what that looks like no matter what it is, whatever the diversity is, because it really comes down to teaching and learning and being a human being and all of those good things that get wrapped up into one package and it's gonna change for that student. You don't know what happened to them as soon as they walk through the door. Same, I don't know what what's happened to everybody here today. I don't know what you walked in the door with. So how do you understand that? And then how do you bring that person to the next level? But it really would be incumbent on the, the teaching strategies that you use in order to help those students. I have two quick uh, responses. A great question. Uh, one is uh, with, with some of the curricula that I see out there uh, in the schools currently, they're uh, in some ways addressing a diversity by saying, you know what, different different things stress different people, uh, that um, different people react differently to stressors, uh, that different things work for, for different people around uh, managing stress. So one of the ways it sort of it becomes part of daily life. The other uh, uh, thing I just wanted to point out as well is uh, we all see um, other perspectives better and um, also uh, in, in terms of being able to uh, see behavior as communication. We all do that better when we are re well regulated. So the other part of that is how do we help and support uh, teachers and staff uh, to be comfortable, secure, feel safe, feel good, and feel regulated so that they can, um, uh, they can be there for the students in that way. So, I think we have to model that too as like administrators. Um, you know, it's okay. I'm the first one. I don't know what you're talking about. Or I made a mistake. Or needing things to be a certain way. Katie and I had this conversation right before here. We have two different PowerPoints. Did you guys all notice that? Because it changed over. And I was like, wait a minute. That, it doesn't look like I expect it to look like. And I'm like, well, forget it. We'll just do two, two different PowerPoints. It's okay, right? Everybody understood what happened tonight. So you have to be able to say how you feel that advocacy peeps. Or I don't understand what you're saying. I can't get my head around this. But it's it's okay to say that in front of staff too, and staff to say it in front of students. I don't know. I don't know what you're what you're saying. I, may, let me go learn about that. Or could you give me another example? It's it's okay to not know something. In a similar vein to, to what Al was asking, but we do have all these great resources, all these personnel. Uh, the kids know how to access those resources. I know you know teachers are a lot of front line, but say you know as, as Linda mentioned, you know. The higher uh, kids are taking five APs and honors classes, and, and they don't want the teacher to know that they're stressed out because you know that would take the facade away. Do they know who to go to, and, and do they access those those resources? I was yes, they they line up outside <laughs> everybody's door, like knocking. Yeah, they know who they are because they're in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, they're not this this figure that's in, a, in an office. They're out in the schools and they're constantly introduced, so students understand who those people are. But it, it, you make a key point because I want to say what was it? Maybe three or four years ago, um, the high school had so many changes. There was one year there was a large retirement pool, like I want to say twenty nine teachers, and the high school had to go back to their staff at a faculty meeting and be like. Let's go through who's who amongst this whole building and who does what and who accesses what. So you do sometimes have to take a step back and say, what are we doing? Who are all these people to move forward again? So those kind of things are helpful. But the students are pretty um, good at understanding where they need to be. If they haven't told their teacher, they can find the department coordinator. Typically, the teachers are like, well, if you want to go to the next step, you need to talk to so-and-so. They're here. And same with parents. So they find us, find everyone. I think also in terms of the counseling staff, um, things have sort of changed a little bit since we were um, young, and um, guidance counselors are teaching whole class lessons from K to 12. Um, so there go we have a developmental guidance curriculum in Massachusetts, and the guidance counselors at every level are going in, or school counselors at every level are going into the classroom. Um, and for example, at the high school, they do a program called Break Free from Depression, and they do that in ninth grade. So um, every ninth grader sees their guidance counselor um, come into a class 
you know, five times during the course of the, into a, into a health class. And also I think the sort of what I see as Chelmsford's answer to the small schools initiative, which is to have um, a, a dean, a counselor, a psychologist, and a house model um, where students are followed throughout their four years really creates a, a better sense of community where folks are moving moving through together and those people become very familiar to them and they're not sort of changing every year. Um, and I think that helps them access the resources that they that they need. There was a question in the back too. When after this one, yeah. oh, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> well, questions from from parents and and other folks other than us is very are very important to me because I want to know what people are thinking of. But one of the things I wanted to maybe recommend because things change so much all the time, and uh, this is fairly new in the sense of. I don't think this is new at all. I think we've always been doing this all throughout our lives. I think we as parents at home, I know I do, try very hard to deal with this issue all the time because you see studies out there everywhere. Valedictorians don't often succeed. Um, and the reason they don't many times, although you know I'm, I'm not going to make past judgments or anything, I think it's because you have to truly educate the entire person. And a lot of times, if you focus just on one side of things, you're not going to succeed. So you have to be able to do this. And I think we've always been trying to do this in our own homes. We now see you uh, or the school systems focusing a lot on it because maybe the norms are not there in every single home. It's changing a lot very quickly. Um, so given that, Especially in transitional years, for example, when children are entering our system, in the K, maybe even in CHIPS, when they're entering the system, giving parents a guide that just a one pager that says, okay, if this is the problem you have, this is where you go. If you do the same at the fourth grade level as they're going, going into the fifth grade, and then recommendation, do it again when they're transitioning to high school. Because I think that as a parent who recently had children transition into high school um, and hoping that everything would be fine and they would do quite well emotionally, socially, and academically in that transition, um, for some of the wonderful students around them who were their friends, they didn't do as well. And parents didn't know where to go. And those, are, those were good parents. I mean, people who really cared about their student. Not that I'm saying there aren't people who don't care. But they, I saw them. I know what was going on. It would be important for us as a community to just have that one sheet thing that says, OK, this is where you go. Maybe the student doesn't want to seek the help, but maybe the parent knows that the student needs the help and doesn't know where to go. So I think it would be extremely important. And I know at the high school level, you're trying to show them independence and teaching them that resilience and being their own person and making their own choices. But still, especially in the transition, parents need to be involved. Um, so it would be extremely helpful if we did that as a school community. Thank you. I do have the eight by 10 glossies. You did see those up front earlier, right, of everybody's picture. That's the, that's the start, that's the start, the eight by 10 glossies that I have of everyone, of the pictures, yeah. We're starting the whole, whole piece. Some people need a new picture, though. <laughs> no, you, you're all set, so <laughs> you're good. <laughs> I have two questions. Um, one is um, we talked about teaching kids uh, grit, resiliency, and everything else like that. And we've all obvious, um, also commented here that there are life skills that we are teaching them and we have to. Um, do we have post-graduation statistics maybe from alumni or something that sort of corroborate that and help us? I mean, that may be a measure of success that we use in our community's high school measure of success index, right, rather than just use an MCAS-based thing or something, life success form or college success form or something like that as a, as a way to, you know, think about how our kids are doing better outside once they are 
outside of this high school system and are, they've graduated, they've gone into a real life or responsible life, right? So that's one question there. So any comments on that? Uh, well, I mean, one of the things we have for, for college, we have persistence rates. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education provides that for us. So we know students that are finishing four-year, two-year private public schools. So typically if the persistence rates are high, that means students are successful, they're following through. If we started to see that the the um, statistics were changing, then we would probably have to assess, okay, why is it that perhaps they do leave, they go on to college, but they're not finishing college, right? Because that would be incumbent of what's either happening in society or perhaps what's happening when they leave. So we have that information. We do have um, additional postgraduate information from students too. So a lot of that we get from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, along with like our dropout rates, any of those type of things, which fortunately for Chelmsford, our persistence rates are high, our dropout rates are low, so, I mean, if, if non-existent. Um, so we, we have that information. Uh, other than that, our students come back. Not only do they come back, they work for us, they hang out with us, they're everywhere. Um, so you'll find in this community, I think mean, John is a um, graduate of the uh, Chelmsford Public Schools, so here's one of your um, former students. So in this community, I'm not, oh, we have one up, one up back, we have Dan, Sylvia, we got everybody. Raise your hand, we got Amy. <laughs> I'm, I'm just blowing from Arlington. I don't know what's happening. Oh, we got Jason. See, they're all here. Yeah. So one of the things, it is one of the funniest things at graduation, the kids go. All of a sudden, like two or three days later, they're back. We're like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, go. It's like the end of Ferris Bueller, but they come back and they want to be part of things. They want, they, they volunteer their time. So that it's not necessarily a statistics, like we're not writing it down who's who, but you can see that in this community. And that's, you know, I think one of the, you know, the charming pieces of Chelmsford, right? People will tell you that people are really involved. I, I've been here for almost 26 years now. So I've seen that um, happen with the, and for teaching here and working here, I've seen it with the students and I've just seen it with everybody in the, in the community as a whole. But for actual hard data, we get that from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Thank you for two. that um, insight. Um, the second question, and maybe it's an open question, doesn't have to be always answered, have to be answered here. Um, but a lot of research, at least, again, research in New York Times or published somewhere else in education systems and stuff, is that, um, and, and you alluded to this condition where high school students especially are taking lots of courses and are getting stressed in the mornings and are coming up sleepy to school and stuff. Are a late school start time even for high school and pushing that down that line so that, you know, we have a later school start? Is that even a consideration? Uh, and maybe that's a school committee decision, but as educators, as guidance counselors, as, you know, psychologists and other people who see the transitional years, and I speak from my personal experience. I didn't grow up in the United States and didn't study in the United States high school system, but I didn't start school until 9 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I was still awake up by 5.30 out of stress and everything else, finishing up homework. <laughs> but still, it allowed me that enough amount of time mm -hmm. to, uh, I felt now reflecting back that it was more of a, a more congenial time at least, uh, especially in those uh, times when you don't get to sleep as much or you're you know, stressed all quite a bit. So just some comments there maybe, or it's a topic for discussion later on at the school committee and, and the implications. Thank you. It was our last session. We had a whole session on it. It was unbelievable. Donna did a great job. No, I think a lot of people talk about this. I mean, we've heard it from different communities. Just This is just my two cents. Uh, nobody's not in agreement with it, but there's a lot of logistical pieces that go with it, and I think that's what m might get in the way rather than what the, the research says. So there's a lot of moving components. You have people for it, people against it. What would that look like for transportation? What would that look like for the school day? What does that look like at the end of the school day for students that have to be home for the their, for their siblings, so there's a lot to it. So it is something that's being talked about. Do we have a formal process around it right now? No. We can see what the other school districts are doing as well. It's always good to learn from how they've implemented something. So I think that you'll be hearing about that for quite some time, unless someone wanted to say something different. Um, out in the front here, I know she's good. She's running. She's getting her steps in. <laughs> <laughs> My two cents. <laughs> Some school districts are changing the day by 20 minutes. Yeah, it it fouls up everything and doesn't make, in my humble opinion, a damn bit of change at all. If you're going to make a change, 
It should be significant. Yeah, I mean, we're in school, at, you know, uh, seven whatever. Mm-hmm. And nine, so to get 19. to nine o'clock, you know, it's a, it's a half the day. Yeah. Um, so Lunch. I think what people have to have to um, come to grips with is maybe it's true, but you have to weigh it against, as you were commenting on, all the things that take place in, in the rest of the day, and it's a nightmare. So if you see if you see school districts changing for twenty minutes, that means they're bowing to the latest research and not changing a blessed thing. Hi, thank you. Um, As a parent, I'm just wondering what resources you might recommend for, um, say, elementary school children who are having problems with social emotional learning, emotional regulation, Trying to seek outside of school help is very difficult to find a therapist that's actually taking on clients um, and resources. And you know, if it, could you point parents in the right direction? Is what I'm asking because you know, it's it, the time goes by fast and the school year goes by fast, and before you know it, you know, you haven't done anything to help them out. So, as a parent. Yeah, I think a few things. One is that um, this is a very common problem, and we um, are part of the Massachusetts School Mental Health Consortium, and I personally attend the monthly meetings, and wait time for a therapist is is significant. Um, there's there are a few things. One is, of course, insurance, right? And, and it depends on what kind of insurance you have and whether or not the, your, um, you know, your insurance company will cover things or if they have a referral service themselves. In Chelmsford, we do have access to project uh, to interface, and that helps um, parents with calling, um, and they have sort of a bank of, of resources. Um, I would sort of recommend with starting with your child's school counselor um, and, and talking with them about maybe some other therapists that other families have, have used, um, because it is hard um, to find a therapist. And then you have to, it's not just like you find a therapist and you go and everything is great, right? It's a process. And sometimes it's not the right fit, depending on what your child's particular needs are um, or your family's particular needs are. Um, so I would recommend sort of starting there um, or with interface. Um, and if you don't have any luck, we, we should talk and, and sort of see what, what some of the issues are and, and whether we can be of assistance to your particular situation. Right. It's a sure. It's a referral resource, so you um, can call them, and they have um, access to sort of a bank of of therapists in the area, and, and knowing and understanding their specialties. A lot of insurance companies also have that resource. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield definitely on their website. You can look up by um, sort of area of need and specialty. You know what the therapists are with, within your area, um, and I think also uh, as parents, sort of keeping in mind that there may not be. Um, the right fit right here in Chelmsford and that it may mean a 15 or a 20 minute, you know, drive to North Andover or, or an, another place that might have sort of more um, therapists available. It also might mean taking them out of school for part of the day to receive therapy because before and after school appointments are also a barrier to treatment. Mm-hmm. So that is you true. might have to support them in that way too mm-hmm. and, and realize that they might have to miss part of their school day once a week or something. That is true. And and some schools are sort of piloting. um, We we haven't talked about this, but some schools are are piloting sort of doing some of that work, you know, inside of the inside of schools. But, um, you know, we certainly do have um, some capacity for that, depending on on what the situation is, certainly short term until a child can get into um, to see a therapist. We have a question in the back. Did she get an ice cream at Sully's or something at the end of this? I mean, I'm assuming. <laughs> um, <laughs> Try so, to plug. <laughs> I am also a parent um, and have recently gone through that. And I, I, I know that you said interface, and this is the second time that we've heard it. But I would like to reiterate that because I did reach out to a whole bunch of therapists and got on eight waiting lists. And finally, somebody suggested interface. 
an interface is a place that you call, give them your information, tell them what you're looking for, tell them your insurance, and within a few days, they got back to me with more than one available therapist. Um, so that is a really great resource, um, but it was not the first thing that was given to me, and and so it is available. But you know, I went through a lot of a lot of other routes and kept hitting dead ends. Um, so I strongly would encourage that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's my question, and this is going to be for, you know, math, technology, the folks who um, do statistics and evaluations and so on. Um, we grade. We grade um, people when they get a wonderful, do a wonderful essay. We grade on curriculum. This is becoming part of our curriculum. This is it part of it all. How do we evaluate this? How do we grade this? How do we assess this? We talked about surveys. We've talked about, you know, what happens after they leave school. Are we doing the right thing? All of that. How do we help teachers so that they model it? All of these things. How about the students themselves? Is there a talk out there about um, possibly actually giving, I don't want to say a reward, but some kind of, of grade when they, they leave the system to say, okay, you really did try your very best at all of these aspects of your learning. Is there anything that anybody is doing out there to do this kind of thing? We give them a diploma. No kidding. Um, I will tell you, but, but we, we and I talked about this, though, a little bit. When we, we have, um, at the elementary level, we do have standards-based report cards. And with standards-based report cards, what that does is it pulls out the behaviors that promote school success, right? Mm -hmm. So when you say grading, you know, nobody wants to be like, oh, you got an A for you know, B, all of that. But it does give that, that key that you can take a look. It's, it's just a plus and a minus. Is it happening? Is it not happening? So you could take that piece. There's also some surveys that have been done for students, like the, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. We have other students um, with, um, oh, I forget the name of it. They've, they, there's another survey that took it will come to me at some point. But a lot of that, too, has to happen in the classroom. Like, how do you assess yourself? How do you think you did, right, when you were writing this piece or taking this test? So if they don't take those steps, you can't just you know, grade them on something you haven't directly taught. But those behaviors that promote school success take it away from what they were supposed to learn, the actual standard, compared to how they're learning it. And I think that's what you're trying to get at, and that would show at least K through 4 if we were to look at all of those report cards collectively. We would be able to see if there was this one behavior, let's say, for school success that's just not being met across the board. Perhaps that's something that we would want to put some efforts into to see how we could improve that for students. If, oh, can I just? You don't. Ha you don't have your microphone. John, I have the microphone right. Now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe if, if you don't mind, just either Lorraine or Eric or Katie, if you want to just touch on the fact that, um, you know, for the last couple of years, we're really putting a lot of time and effort into the. You'll, you'll get the microphone in a minute. We've been putting a lot of time into the, um, you know, social emotional learning and setting up the right structures to really support the work. Maybe just talk for a few minutes about, um, like, some of the data collection that we're actually doing in the schools, how instead of, you know, individually kind of grading students, but, you know, um, how buildings are actually uh, taking a look at uh, some of the data that they're collecting and how that's actually having an impact on student behaviors, um, you know, lessening over time, things along those lines. Maybe to just kind of give a sense for, um, again, soft kind of grading about uh, our practices and how they're actually being rolled out in the schools. Sure, I'll, 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 give, it a, uh, I'll give it a go to get started. Um, yeah, so, so uh, yeah, in, in terms of uh, data gathering, I think um, one of the, uh, you know, critical components is sort of getting people on a common page in terms of what, um, what are the data that are going to be uh, useful in terms of decision making? So some of that is behavioral data. Uh, some of that is um, uh, our, our data that, um, uh, you know, sort of that capture um, uh, progress in terms of skills. So a number of this, a couple of the schools um, 
have uh, have begun to um, uh, to look at assessing um, uh, concerns and needs, right? As uh, as um, ways to look at lagging skills or skills to address. Uh, so while I wouldn't consider it a grading system, I think it's sort of the uh, sort of an emerging way of of being able to look at progress. So how are we going to ultimately be able to see that a student is uh, has better impulse control in June than in September, or better emotional regulation in June than in September? So uh, the the thing that we can see, the sort of tangible, uh, if you will, I shouldn't say tangible, but observable piece. Sure, we do. Uh, they they're getting better and better. I think the schools over the, even the last couple of years have seen in terms of uh, getting more accurate behavioral data and data that can be uh, used to identify. Um, uh, let's say risk for for future problems and trying to get at those uh, proactively or at least early reactively around that. Um, yeah, I don't know that I can get any more specific around that than that. I, I will say one thing in, in comment to the general question around um, uh, grading around uh, social emotional learning skills uh, that there's uh, sort of an emerging uh, field around this and uh, we're seeing uh, all across the country uh, first attempts let's say at things like I can statements so from K to 12 sort of breaking those down when I'm in in kindergarten I can do X Y and Z as they pertain to uh, social emotional competencies um, all the way through through 12 and I think that's sort of the uh, the train that's sort of running around um, uh, being able to uh, assess skill development, you know, as opposed to um, you know, really sort of taking a bite out of what, how do we notice skills growing, you know. I think one other thing to mention as far as data goes. Um, so I did the same thing. I'm like, who is that? Oh, it's, yeah. <laughs> like, who is that? My, where's it coming from? Yeah. Um, one other thing worth mentioning, I think, I think we're in the process of exploring different ways to um, gather data. So, for example, at um, the South Row Elementary School right now, uh, they that school offered to pilot um collecting data on our second step curriculum. So I think as a lot of these newer things come out, as we kind of brought in rejuvenated second step um, and brought in our consultants, some um, PBIS strategies, some new SEL strategies, I think we're kind of at the stages where we're starting to explore different data avenues as well. Um, so, for example, that at South Row, the second step data, where we're looking for student growth data on that. So we actually are um, not even at the point right now that we've seen our post data results. So I think it's something that we're always thinking of and trying to be thoughtful about how we're collecting this data, when we're collecting this data, is it at a time that students are, we have to be cognizant of um, all the assessments and the tests that they're already doing, and we don't want to add to that. So I think these are the things that are always part of the discussion, but we want this information too, to see where we are making growth, where we still need to continue to make growth, and where we need to go next. So one thing I wanted to say was uh, that uh, I think that there's the grading and then there's feedback to the kids, and I think that it does happen on a regular basis. So I was actually gonna kick the microphone over to Dr. McMahon so that she could talk about some of the ways, I've always wanted to do this, um, that uh, her um, students receive feedback uh, through PBIS. Okay. Yes, so um, thank you, Donna, <laughs> for offering this. Um, so a couple things. Um, one, I think um, assessing uh, social emotional learning is important to a degree, but I think we want to be careful with that. Um, I think we are giving surveys, uh, teacher fidelity, but also um, what is the growth of students, but I think there's also students that can tell you what they should do and tell you the right answer, but can they do it in the moment? So some of that's not really totally measurable, um, and I also agree with the 
if we're talking about stressors and rising stressors, we don't want to give more tests. Um, so I think we want to be careful and balance that. Um, through PBIS, though, and at most of the schools have this happening too, but um, through PBIS, we do a lot of different feedback to kids. Um, so obviously at a whole school level, we're doing second step and we're doing our passport expectations. So we use the pride tickets. I know all the elementary schools have some sort of uh, feedback system in terms of uh, when they're showing those skills. So again, that goes back to um, you don't want to just take a test, but when you're actually showing a skill in action, you want to be able to reward that with the positive feedback right away. Um, I think a lot of our um, teachers give a lot of feedback through the report card, and they have those discussions with kids around those um, skills for learning. Um, in addition, we obviously have some interventions at the tier two level, so we're kind of trying to further build their skill sets, and so then they get feedback on how they're doing um, in their intervention groups. Um, and obviously, um, through tier three, when students have a really specific plan around their emotional regulation or behavior, or again, those um, learning aspects that we're trying to teach them, they have some really specific feedback with either behavior plans, incentive plans, charts, things like that. So I think um, we are trying to measure growth in those skills, but I think we also want to be careful with, um, you know, a lot of those skills are so hard to measure a direct um, line of growth. Um, some of that's up and down, um, depending on the, di the day, the stressors, et cetera. Um, so I could give this back to Donna now. <laughs> Uh, Don, I think one of the other things that we have to keep in mind is you know, we, we usually do work with students that are showing some of these, you know, stressors or, you know, dysregulation. I'm always concerned about the quiet child. You know, how are you going to find that out? What are teachers doing in the classroom to gain their perspective, to gain um, what their knowledge is? What did they learn in your classroom? Just because someone's quiet doesn't necessarily mean that they've learned everything. They always use that analogy, the iceberg, right? You see the tip, but then underneath is the whole rest of the child. And those are the students that we have to also make sure that there's something in place to understand where they're at, where they're coming from, because that's, that's someone who could slip through the cracks very easily because they look compliant, but perhaps something else is going on. So that was just something that I, I've had conversations with teachers all the time about, well, how did you know that, you know, these three students here understood something because they didn't say a word during the whole class. These three dominated the class, right? I'm thinking again in terms of the transitional years. So wonderful, I think a lot's being done at the elementary level uh, from what I've heard in reports and presentations um, at the Council of Schools and many other uh, presentations that have been made by the coordinators. What happens and what system do we have in place to uh, transition the children who, the student who may be having, is having some stressors, some issues that have been identified how do we transition those students to the next level, be it to the middle school or then to the high school? And um, is there anything that can help the next level other than, you know, because we have privacy concerns, we have many things that go on in the schools. Um, how do we involve the parents in those transitions and so on, if anybody can comment on that? Sure. Um, a couple of things. One with the, the counselors, um, they meet one level to the next. Um, so elementary counselors with middle school counselors, the ones who work with um, the incoming fifth graders, and then again um, at the high school level. So I'm just now um, scheduling times for um, uh, Melissa uh, from Parker and Moya from um, McCarthy to meet individually with each one of the high school counselors to talk about um, students who really need that um, extra support for a really a continuum of care, you know, um, students who have been being seen either individually or in groups um, and, 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 you know, sort of talking through what the best ways to support those students are. I also think that we have some thinking to do as a district about, um, you know, what's happening at the elementary level with second step and sort of how we're continuing that into, into middle school. We have some other specific programming that happens in middle school around, um, issues more specific to middle school, but also sort of making sure that students have um, the opportunities to continue to practice the skills that they've learned. Um, and um, there are some some programs and things like that, but um, working with the middle school counselors um, on 
something that's more developmentally appropriate for, for middle school. Um, yeah, and I think for um, just even our transitions for all of our students, we actually, they'll be coming up in the next few weeks transitioning for the curriculum nights from fourth grade into fifth grade at McCarthy and then also Parker. The high school has a pretty pretty deep mentoring program and um, even putting into place about three, four years ago, having the, soft, uh, the freshmen come by themselves to high school without the rest of the, the community there has been, you know, very successful, as well as having those mentors there that those first few weeks, they have their shirts on, they know who to go to and help those students through just to, you know, familiarize themselves with, with the schools. Pausing. See how I'm doing that? That's the pause button. Nice. Yeah, nice wait time. Did you like that? Okay, seeing no more questions, uh, motion to adjourn. No, <laughs> I'll have, I'll have uh, Chair King come back up and kind of close everything up. We appreciate everybody for coming out tonight and having a conversation with us. Um, sometimes we don't get this opportunity. But I would suggest that for the school committee meetings, there's always either a school or a department being highlighted. So if you can't obviously physically make it to the meeting, tune in or you can always go back. There's always reruns. If you have nothing going on, if instead of doing one of those Netflix shows, you can always just do school committee. We could actually have our own show on that. It'd be unbelievable. So um, I'm going to turn it over to you. Just, just echoing what, what Linda said, I'd like to thank you all uh, for coming out tonight or for watching um, from home uh, to learn about social emotional learning and to support what we're doing in our schools. Uh, I'd like to thank our presenters, who I thought did a fantastic job uh, going, over, <laughs> going over what we do here in Chelmsford to support our, our students' emotional well-being. Uh, I'd like to thank the Chelmsford Police for allowing us to use this fantastic facility. Uh, for Chelsea Telemedia, for filming not only this forum, but all three forums that we've done. So this will be available on tape if anybody wants to go back and watch it again. Um, I'd also like to finally like to thank the superintendent, assistant superintendent, for um, doing all the work to, to put together these, these panels and to, to put forward all this information um, for all three of our forums. And I think it's been very successful. Um, it's our intention as a committee to continue with these public forums next year. So if anyone has any suggestions on topics that they would like to hear about next year, uh, feel free to contact any of us on the committee, and we'll definitely take that up uh, in, in the next school year. So thank you once again for coming out. I hope everybody has a great uh, end of the school year, and uh, we'll see you back here again next year. Thank you.